All right, welcome back to our third and what should be the final video on risk analysis. So at the end of the last video, we were beginning to talk about quantitative risk analysis, which essentially is um, a more detailed, more complex, more thorough investigation of probabilities of various types of risk occurring. <clears throat> there are several different methods of quantitative risk analysis, um, and we're going to briefly go over a few of them. Uh, a decision tree analysis, uh, so this is like a graphical tool, it's kind of like a flow chart uh, where you can see how um, all of the different paths you might take if you make one choice versus another, and then uh, that leads to different outcomes, and then those outcomes you can make different choices. And as you uh, graphically um, create all these different uh, decision paths, you can uh, look at the risks involved with each of them and, uh, and do a comparison and uh, determine which ones will um, have the le least amount of risk uh, or uncertainty uh, and which ones can uh, maximize um, monetary return. A uh, second type of quantitative analysis would be an expected monetary value analysis or EVA analysis. And so this is a statistical analysis of calculating um, the present value of future outcomes. So um, uh, essentially it's uh, looking at uh, financial um, uh, returns on an investment or project, um, looking at the time value of money, um, something that we get into quite a bit in uh, engineering economics, um, but this would be um, uh, along those lines of calculating present value of a future investment. <laughs> future mode and effect analysis, or FMEA, the PMI defines that as a step-by-step -step approach for identifying all possible failures in the design, a manufacturing or assembly process, or a product or service. So essentially this is a very detailed analysis of trying to look at everything that could possibly go wrong um, and um, identifying all of those potential failures and um, coming up with a plan to deal with each and every one. Sensitivity analysis is another type of analysis we've done in uh, my uh, engineering economics class. Uh, it's essentially posing the question of what if um, you can uh, develop a plan based on certain assumptions, but what if those assumptions change? What if you uh, are developing a new product that you think you can sell for $100, but what if, um, because of uh, competition in the marketplace, you have to lower the price to $80 per unit? Um, how is that going to affect the profitability of the project? Uh, what if fuel costs go up? What if um, you know utility costs go up? What if there's... Um, labor issues. So you essentially look at all of these different what-if scenarios and uh, it essentially helps you come up with um, a measurement of certainty or uncertainty regarding a project. Um, so uh, if you do perform a sensitivity analysis and you find that um, even if fuel costs go up or labor prices go up or you know, the, these um, risks occur if the uh, project will still be successful, in other words, make a profit, then, um, then you can be a lot more confident going forward than if uh, the alternative would be a sensitivity analysis is performed and you find that even the slightest change in your predictions will mean that the project will lose money. Um, that would be a very sensitive project and um, the risk might not be worth taking. Um, so the project might not go forward. 
And then there are various simulation techniques. The most well-known one is a Monte Carlo simulation, which uses um, random number generating software um, like Excel could be used to do a Monte Carlo simulation um, to essentially um, test hundreds of thousands or at least tens of thousands of potential outcomes and looking at what the um, the averages or, or um, you know statistical simulations suggest will be the outcome of a, a given situation and uh, the results of a Monte Carlo simulation can also um, give you insight into whether or not um, a project is worth undertaking based on uh, the risk of success or failure. So the risk register, again, uh, we've mentioned this several times throughout the chapter, essentially is a document that includes all of the information um, regarding potential risks to a project. It needs to be kept up to date as things change, as the situ situation changes throughout the life of a project. Um, so probability uh, of each risk occurring is something that needs to be added to the risk register. Um, the results of your risk analysis are included in the risk register. It needs to be kept up to date. Um, including your uh, plans for what to do if the risks occur and any changes to the project need to be reflected in the risk register. So most of the chapter has been spent talking about uh, ways of identifying risks, and categorizing risks, um, and we ha have only a, a little bit of information here at the end uh, on how to then deal with these risks. So once we've identified a potential risk, how do we deal with it? So <laughs> in terms of project threats, um, there are three basic strategies. We can avoid the risk, we can transfer the risk, or we can try to mitigate the risk. So examples of uh, threat avoidance would include changing the project plan. If there's uh, a particular aspect of a plan that is just too risky, you just don't do that particular part of it. You just avoid it. You, you do something else. Um, you could improve project communications. Improved communications is a way to make sure everyone is aware of the potential threat and everyone is doing uh, their best to avoid it. So uh, improved communications can generally help um, any type of uh, risk uh, response, but, uh, and that includes avoidance. Or, as I alluded to in uh, the previous slides here talking about uh, quantitative risk analysis, you may just decide, you know what, it's just not worth it. Uh, there, there's too much of a threat, there's too much risk, uh, the likelihood of a project being successful is just not good enough. We're not comfortable or confident in it, and so we're just not going to do this project. We're, gonna, uh, we're going to invest our resources elsewhere and, and do a different project that has uh, a greater likelihood of, of success. So those are ways to just simply avoid the threat. Another way is to transfer the threat. Insurance, the entire insurance industry is essentially risk transfer. So if you buy your insurance policy and something catastrophic happens, you are not responsible for the damages the insurance company is. So you have transferred that risk to the insurance company. So they are insurance companies are in the business of risk. That's essentially all they do. Um, you could negotiate a fixed price contract with a contractor. So uh, if the project goes over budget, you're not responsible for that, um, for that problem. The contractor would be because you have agreed on a fixed price. Uh, you're going to pay that dollar amount and not a cent more. So regardless of what happens throughout the project, regardless of what threats uh, may be encountered, um, cost overruns, 
um, things like that. You're not responsible for it, the contractor is. Or uh, another example of threat transferring is hiring an expert. Um, just an example that popped into my head is if I were to do a DIY plumbing project, there's a risk that I could mess it up and I could flood my basement, for example. Uh, but if I hire a professional plumber to do it, now that threat, that risk, is, has been transferred to the professional. I'm no longer directly responsible for it. I've hired someone else. Uh, by hiring them, they assume responsibility for that threat. And then there are ways to mitigate threats. We could um, take some uh, steps to try to lower the probability of a threat occurring or uh, lower the impact of a threat. So, um, you know, like for example, using safety equipment properly um, can lower the probability of um, an accident happening or minimize the impact of that accident. Um, you can build in redundancy, so you've got backup uh, plans uh, in case one thing fails, something else can take its place or, or fill in. Um, or if there are different methods uh, that you could choose from, um, you can go with the more reliable one. Uh, maybe it takes more time, uh, maybe it's more expensive, but um, it could potentially reduce the risk if it's more reliable. So the next couple strategies apply to both threats and opportunities, um, which are both types of risks. You can just accept them. You can say, you know what, I, I know there's some risk here associated with this project, but we're going to do it anyways. And if, if it happens, we'll deal with it. Um, so uh, the other thing you can do is if you decide to proceed despite the threats, you can um, be aware of what the triggers are and keep a very close eye on them and uh, try to uh, avoid them as much as possible. And of course, having contingencies set up, having some money set aside or some time in the schedule set aside for risks that you, you know you're going to uh, run into and you're willing to accept that. You're, you're willing to deal with it. Uh, you can um, research. That's another strategy. So uh, get yourself informed, uh, get better training, get to know more about the risk in order to deal with it in a more effective manner. Um, you might need to verify some assumptions. Maybe, maybe you're making some guesses or assumptions and you're not really sure. If you do some more research, you can be more sure. Uh, and testing things like the use of prototypes um, can help you to um, learn more about potential risks, including ways to avoid them or uh, correct them. Um, and uh, can help the design process. And then finally, for dealing with opportunities, you can exploit an opportunity. If you see a, a chance to, um, to be successful, um, you want to put your best people on it. You assign your most talented resources to that project. You can give more emphasis to that particular project. Um, you can share an opportunity. So if you, uh, you might form a joint venture with other um, companies um, to, um, to share the opportunity. Um, you're also, by forming a joint venture, potentially sharing the risk as well. And um, you can enhance an opportunity. If you've got a uh, um, a chance to make some money, why not try to make even more money? So you can try to increase the positive impact. You can um, maximize the key drivers that are going to, uh, to, to lead to this uh, enhanced opportunity and uh, just add more resources. Um, so um, the more resources you commit to the project, the more you can uh, get out of it. So that's it for risk management. Um, put your questions on the discussion board if you have any.